chapter 63. Um, I'm going to try to get through that in the next hour, and then Darla is going to lecture just a little tidbit on diabetes. Okay. On your renal exam, you'll have probably three to five questions that relate to diabetes. Okay. So the bulk of what you are tested on is 35 points. Okay. So like 98% of it is going to be renal. Okay, but we've talked a little bit of diabetes because we know that if I'm an uncontrolled diabetic, I'm going to have renal difficulties. Okay? So, acute kidney injury. We have our same priority concept for elimination, acid base, fluid and electrolyte, immunity, but we get something different here this time. We get perfusion. Okay? Because... Acute kidney injury is when we have a rapid reduction in kidney function resulting in our ability to be able to eliminate waste and then do all of those essential things for fluid and electrolyte, acid, base, and balance, okay? As well as red blood cell formation and vitamin D, okay? Now, this usually happens rapidly, okay? Over a few hours, okay, to days. And you guys may see it on the med search floor when we have patients who have had trauma or significant blood loss. Okay, so if you look at your patients who've had significant blood loss, or maybe they're getting a nephrotoxic substance. Okay, like what? Vacomycin. Okay. So. Acute kidney injury, the cause, reduced perfusion to the kidneys, reduced perfusion to the kidneys, or damage to the kidney tissue, obstruction of urinary outflow. Okay, our risk factors, number one, shock, cardiac surgery, hypotension. Okay, so if we have a patient who has hypovolemic shock, okay, and their blood pressure is low, okay, that's kind of a double whammy. Okay, and then prolonged mechanical ventilation, and we're seeing a lot of patients with prolonged mechanical ventilation because of COVID. And then sepsis. Okay, what is sepsis? Bacteria in your blood, okay, where that infection has gone systemic throughout your whole entire body, and you can start to get multi-system failure, multi-organ failure. Right? Older adults and people who have chronic diseases are at a higher risk. Okay. So what do we want to do to promote it? Two to three liters of water a day and make sure that we're avoiding nephrotoxic substances. Okay. In your book, there's a chart on page 1377 that lists nephrotoxic drugs okay, and substances. So if you're looking, okay, vacamycin. Amphotericin B, genomycin, um, some of our chemotherapeutic agents, methotrexate, we'll talk about that, um, or you'll, you'll learn about that in um, musculoskeletal. And then look at all of these NSAIDs, okay? Um, ibuprofen, endomethacin, naproxen, those are all on there. Acetaminophen, okay? Now, I want to draw your attention to captopril. Okay, so even though it's given as one of the drugs, because it's an ACE inhibitor, okay, it can also cause nephrotoxicity. Okay, so we have to be aware of that, right? Metformin, okay, what, what's metformin used for? Diabetes, Diabetes okay. Um, then you've got ethylene glycol, um, you've got pesticides, um, some other things, um, lead, um, bismuth, um, those types of things, okay? So there will always be some things, okay, and, and you say, well, if vancomycin is on the list, then why do we use it, okay? Because we have to look at that patient and we look at benefits versus risk, okay? And the benefits of the antibiotic or the benefits of the captopril um, outweigh the risk, we use it. Okay? So we look at their history. Changes in urine appearance, frequency, volume. 
Have they had recent surgery or trauma, transfusions, allergic reactions? What's their drug history? What are their coexisting conditions? Do they have heart disease? Do they have diabetes? Do they have hyperparathyroidism? What else is going on with them? Okay. Um, immunity mediated a, a, acute kidney injury. We're going to anticipate acute kidney injury after a period of hypotension and shock. Okay. We just need to say that that's a given because of the amount of time that they have not had good perfusion to the kidney. Okay, so if I am dehydrated, okay, I have not had good fluid intake, my volume is decreased, I am suffering from hypotension, okay, we should automatically think I've got a two kidney injury. Okay, significant blood loss in surgery. Okay, need to think about that. Okay, and if they have any history of the obstructive problems. So, the stenosis, um, the sclerosis, um, the scar tissue, the strictures, um, stones, any of that puts us at risk. So what am I going to do? Hourly urine output. Okay. I cannot stress to you guys enough accurate I and O. How many of you work as techs? Raise your hand high. Okay. You have one of the most important jobs, okay, because whose job is it to record I know? Yours, okay? So as a nurse, I'm going to rely on Sarah or Kiana, okay, if they're helping me care for my patient, okay, to accurately record every I know that that patient has. Because if I don't have an accurate output, okay, I could be missing that my patient's got acute kidney injury. Okay, so we want to look at hourly output, and what should it be a minimum of? 30. 30. Okay, 30. We're going to assess for fluid overload. We're going to look at their vital signs for hyperperfusion and hypoxemia. Okay, so we need to remember that if we have a patient who is in like in-stage renal disease, chronic kidney disease, their kidneys are shutting down, they're going to have acid-base imbalance. Okay? They're going to have acid-base imbalance, and I'm going to see one thing probably with their respirations, and what is that? What's going to happen? Hyperventilation. Okay, there's a specific type of respiratory rate called Kussmaul's. Okay, those deep, rapid respirations because I've got too much acid and I'm trying to get rid of it. I'm trying to blow off that CO2. Okay, so I'll see that and then what else might I see? If I'm in acid-base imbalance, okay, my breathing's weird, what do people always want to do? Give them oxygen, right? Okay. Is oxygen going to fix my patient? No. No. Okay, what's going to fix my patient? Correcting my acid-base imbalance. Okay. So giving, giving my acid-base imbalance patient more oxygen is not going to help them. Okay, and sometimes that's hard for patients' families to understand because they're like, oh my gosh, they're breathing wrong. Give them oxygen. Oxygen's going to fix them. Okay, but it doesn't because it's not a matter of them getting the right amount of oxygen. It's a matter of they've got too much acid in their system. Okay, to be able to process good oxygenation. Okay. So our lab, we're going to look at our BUN, our electrolytes, our urine. Okay, assessments are all going to be the same for acute kidney injury. Okay. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to try to avoid hypotension. So what are some things that we can do to avoid hypotension? How do we 
face, hypotension, low blood pressure. Loud. Fluid. Okay. Volume expanders. Okay. What else? Get rid of our nephrotoxics if we can. Okay. What else? What else can cause hypotension? Okay. So too much of our blood pressure medicines. Okay, so maybe I have been on some pretty hefty doses of antihypertensives that have caused excessive dilation. Okay, that in this state of acute kidney injury, I don't need all of these big gun um, antihypertensives. So we back off on those meds. Okay, so that we're not causing a state of hypertension. Okay. We're going to look at our lab values. We're going to watch our INO, okay? And then our drug therapy, okay? We may need to give things to increase our blood pressure, okay? Our volume expanders and those types of things. Nutrition, okay? We're always going to watch our sodium, our protein, and then our caffeine, our alcohol. We're going to watch smoking. And then we're going to think about kidney replacement therapy. And what is that? Dialysis. Kidney replacement therapy is dialysis. Okay. So the patho for chronic kidney disease is that it's end-stage renal disease. Um, it's progressive. It's irreversible. You get azotemia, uremia, and uric syndrome. Okay, and that basically means that the acids and the nitrogen waste build up within your body and it starts affecting every single body system that you have. Okay? Um, I think this is posted um, on Canvas, but I'll pass it around just in case. But it shows you kind of how every single body system is affected by end-stage renal disease. Okay. Um, I think I have two of them. Maybe you don't. Okay, well, pass that around if you wanted to. Oh, no, here's the other one. You can take a picture of it with your phone if you want. Okay, and then there are five stages of kidney disease. Okay, I'm not going to test you on it. Okay, but it's one of the things that when you look in your text... Okay, um, it's table 63.6 on 1384. Okay, it's always kind of interesting to me in the fact that as the um, function decreases, there's actually a period of time where you almost have kidneys that are over-functioning and then the kidney function just drops off. Okay, now a patient can have dialysis and still make a little bit of urine. Okay, I think a lot of people have this conception that, um, or a thought where, well, if I'm on dialysis or my patient's on dialysis, they don't make urine at all. Okay, and that's not true. It's just that their elimination is not sufficient. Okay, their kidneys don't eliminate. So then we have to do dialysis to properly eliminate all the waste, okay? So changes, okay? We can start to see structural changes within the kidney. So when, when we're looking at the stages and we're, we're staging them, they're doing scans and they're comparing um, scans from maybe six months or a year ago to today and looking at that change in kidney um, structure. 
um, metabolic changes. We're going to see acid base and fluid and electrolyte changes. Okay, because as the kidneys start to not work, so as the, the function starts to decrease, we're going to see a buildup of our fluid and electrolytes. Okay, so we're going to see hyper states of hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia, all of those things because they're not being metabolized and excreted. Okay, cardiac changes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, heart failure, pericarditis. Okay, because we're starting to see one, the buildup and the malfunction related to our fluid and electrolyte abnormalities, and then also because of the fluid buildup. Okay, because I'm not getting rid of the waste and the fluid like I should. Then I start to see the hematological immunity changes, okay? Because of that red blood cell formation and the erythropoietin that is not being excreted like it should, okay? I can see GI changes related to uh, potassium and, and calcium and then cognitive and functional changes, again, because of the abnormalities associated with the fluid and electrolyte changes. When we look at chronic kidney disease, um, there's over 100 different types of disease processes that can result in kidney function uh, impairment. But the two main causes, hypertension and diabetes. Hypertension and diabetes. Okay. Most adults are going to have chronic kidney disease, but they don't know that they have it. And we have about 15% of the adults in the US are estimated to have chronic kidney disease. So things that we want to do to promote it, okay? Control the diseases that cause chronic kidney disease, okay? Diabetes, making sure that your blood sugar is within range, okay? 70 to 110, okay? Make sure that your hemoglobin A1C is less than 7. Your blood pressure, making sure that your blood pressure, your systolic, is less than about 120 or at 120, okay? Because several years ago, um, the American Heart Association, the Medical, Medical Association kind of changed those guidelines um, that, you know, used to be only worried if it was greater than like 150, okay? But make sure you're aware of what those guidelines are, okay? And we want to promote blood sugars within control and your blood pressure within control, okay? Dietary adjustments. Okay. So if I'm having a lot of swelling, okay, I need to cut back on the sugar, the caffeine, the soda, the things that have phosphorus in them, those types of things. Weight maintenance. Okay. Why would that be important? Why is weight maintenance? important for kidney function. It takes longer to metabolize. Well, it takes longer to metabolize, but when I have excess weight, what's my, what, is it because I have a good healthy diet? No. Okay, so increased weight, okay, then puts me more susceptible to complications, okay? Healing, wound care, respiratory issues, altered nutritional. Um, there's usually some significant deficits because you don't typically have someone who's morbidly obese who has sufficient nutrition, okay? Because I can be really, really overweight, but I could still be deficient in nutrients that I need because my diet is high in fat, high in cholesterol, high in lipids, okay? We want to have our person stop smoking, we want them to exercise, and we want them to limit alcohol, okay? Because alcohol can permanently damage both the liver and have effects on the kidney. So, we want to always get their weight and height, and when you're doing your height, you always want to know whether you are obtaining that height by true measurement, you're measuring them, or you're going off the height that the patient stated to you. Okay, so a stated height would be, I'm 5'8". Okay, um, and if you've ever 
um, been involved with like an admission assessment on an elderly person, okay? Um, because we shrink as we get older, okay? So an elderly person may say, oh, well, I used to be 5'4", but now I think I'm about 5'2", okay? Because patients can shrink up to a couple inches, okay? We want to look at their medical history, especially anything urologic, okay? Any kidney history, their drug use, okay? Over-the-counter, so do they take Tylenol every day? Do they take naproxen? Um, do they use any herbal remedies, um, teas, anything like that? Um, their dietary habits and then any GI or GE problems that they report. Okay. And then we're going to look for um, any signs and symptoms with abnormalities. So if you're looking at that um, sheet of paper that I sent around, any of those abnormalities, okay, um, neurological, cardiovascular, respiratory, hematologic, skeletal, urine or skin, Okay, because any of those can be affected in chronic kidney disease. Okay. So our psychosocial, again, we've got anxiety, fear, coping mechanisms, and then we're strongly going to recommend them to start seeing a mental health professional. Why? It's irreversible. Because it's irreversible. Irreversible. Okay. And what are we honestly preparing them for? Yeah. Death. Okay, so our lab, okay, looking at our cues, we're going to look at our lab, we're going to look at our x-ray, our KUB upright, our CT scan, and then things that we're going to worry about, okay, fluid overload, okay, because the kidneys can't maintain body fluid balance, okay, impaired cardiac function, okay, they've got decreased stroke volume, they're at risk for dysrhythmias because we've got abnormal fluid and electrolytes, this, the potassium gets um, out of whack and we can have um, PVCs and cardiac arrest, um, weight loss because they can't ingest and digest. We start to see um, constipation. We start to see a lot of GI issues. Um, they're not able to absorb their food and nutrients, um, especially calcium and vitamin D. Um, we get the potential for injury, okay? Blood clotting, okay? I mentioned that earlier, that anytime we have trauma, okay, we always worry about blood clotting or if I'm bleeding. Um, and then our psychosocial, okay, due to chronic kidney disease. So our plannings, we're going to manage the volume, we're going to manage the cardiac function, we're hopefully going to enhance their nutrition, and a lot of times that comes in the form of supplements, okay, so like your Insure or your Boost, those types of drinks or shakes. We want them to prevent injury and then minimizing their um, psychosocial compromise. Okay. So, when we look at kidney replacement therapies, there's really two types of dialysis. Okay? There's hemodialysis, where the blood is filtered, and then there's peritoneal dialysis. Okay? So, hemodialysis is what you're going to see in the inpatient setting. Okay? They'll have a shunt um, put in, usually their forearm, um, sometimes it's an IJ, um, but that stays in. Okay? When they have that inserted, Okay. We can't usually use it right away. Okay. We have to let it um, work, you know, kind of settle in, make sure that it's not clotted off. Um, they are very susceptible to bruising, but there are no needle sticks, no blood pressures, nothing constrictive on that arm. Okay. Why? Why do we do that? We don't want it to clot off, and if we're doing needle sticks, it's a potential site for infection, okay? So we don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize its ability to function, okay? So when we're looking at um, the difference, okay, it is really dependent on the physician and the patient condition as to whether they get peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis. Okay. With hemodialysis, okay, that's where they go like three times a week to a clinic, they get hooked up to the machine, and it filters their blood. With peritoneal dialysis, they will have a catheter inserted into their abdomen, and then they actually manage that at home. Okay. 
When I first started in nursing almost 30 years ago, okay, peritoneal dialysis was this huge thing, okay, and we did it in the hospital. Most of your hospitals don't even carry the supplies for peritoneal dialysis anymore. If the patient has it, they have to bring those supplies at home and they manage it, okay. You'll have usually anywhere from a, a, about a two or a three liter bag of um, dialysate solution that they will hook up to the catheter. That solution will drain into the abdominal cavity. Okay, they will have what's called a dwell time. Okay, so an amount of time in which that fluid stays in their abdomen. Okay, and then they open the clamp, and then that fluid drains back out. Okay, and that's peritoneal dialysis. Okay, versus hemodialysis where the blood is actually filtered, okay? What are some complications that you can think of for hemodialysis? We mentioned the infection and the clotting off, but what could happen to our patients with hemodialysis as a complication? Increased risk of like falls because they drowsy. So falls, so if we get too much fluid too fast, you can take out the fluid too fast. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of times, sometimes our patients, maybe they're scheduled for, you know, a 90-minute dialysis session, but fluid is coming off too rapidly that we have to stop after 45 minutes. Okay. Um, infection is usually one of our, our biggest um, things. With um, peritoneal dialysis, infection is also one of our complications um, because we can get peritonitis. Okay, since they're doing it at home, it may not be the cleanest of environments, okay, and that can get infected. Okay, um, one of our other complications is the inability for all the fluid to drain. Okay, so it's always important to make sure that however much fluid they put in, that's the amount of fluid that they take out. Okay, and if for some reason it stops draining, you need to educate the patient to reposition, stand up, sit down, roll over, um, because a lot of times that catheter will get up against um, body tissue inside and it won't drain. Okay, but if you move around, change positions, the catheter moves, and then it drains just fine. Okay, nursing here in the hospital, um, we basically just are kind of hands off and document that the patient does it anymore. Okay, usually we're not involved in the peritoneal dialysis anymore. So here's a couple of examples. You can see how the catheter just kind of sits inside the, the abdominal wall. Um, we'll do their blood pressure before and after. Questions on hemo versus peritoneal? Okay, important for you to keep them separate. Okay. Um, and then we have kidney transplant. Okay. Um, kidney selection um, is a very rigorous process. Um, there is a very rigorous process in which matching occurs. Typically, they do say that the most likely donor would be a direct living relative, but that's not always the case, okay? Um, you get on the waiting list when your um, GFR is less than 20, okay? Um, one of the other criteria, um, you have to have a reasonable life expectancy, okay? So if you have um, severe cardiac disease, you've had a history of maybe four um, open heart surgeries, um, those types of things, and you have multiple other organ issues, you may not be a candidate, okay? If you have cancer, you may not be a candidate, okay? Um, you have to be medically and surgically fit for the procedure, which means you have to be stable enough that they think you're going to live through the procedure, okay? Um, living donors um, have the highest... Um, graft survival rate, as I mentioned, um, and then the other two types of donors are from cadavers or um, 
folks who have died um, with non-beating heart. So their heart has stopped, but they have been kept alive um, on mechanical ventilation um, or CPR in order to uh, transplant or bypass. When we look at ki kidney transplant, okay, usually the patient's going to have dialysis 24 hours after, and then they will also have dialysis post okay, kidney transplant because we want to make sure that the kidneys have time to heal and are functioning. Um, they will also get blood transfusions before surgery to make sure that they've got proper hemoglobin, hematocrit, and erythropoiet. Okay. Um, the procedure kind of varies depending on the physicians, the surgeons, and how they're taught. So um, you can have lateral where they'll uh, make their incisions on the side, um, posterior, so you may have posterior, and then sometimes in rare cases you'll have um, anterior. Okay. Um, sometimes the diseased kidney will stay in, and sometimes they will remove the diseased kidney. So um, if you have a patient who's a transplant patient, it's always kind of neat to look at their x-rays because sometimes you may see where they actually have three kidneys, okay, because they've had their two original kidneys and then they've had one kidney transplanted in. Um, usually the, the diseased kidney is going to kind of shrink and be smaller, um, but they'll leave all the structure there and they'll use... Um, like graft or artificial um, for your um, ureters, okay? Um, so you can see the failed kidneys are left in place, um, new kidney placed right or left um, of the iliac fossa. Um, an example, but it doesn't really show you the other kidneys and their placement, so it's kind of not a very good picture in my opinion because you really kind of need to see the other kidneys, I think. Um, for post-op, okay, urological management, so the urologist and the nephrologist are going to be making very, very frequent rounds. You're going to assess hourly urine output for the first 48 hours, okay, and be very, very aggressive with that. So remember, they're probably going to have a Foley catheter, okay, and they should have what's called a graduated cylinder on the outside of the Foley. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Um, it's like this hard plastic, um, yeah, kind of like a box, a cylinder um, that has a little twist drain that it measures usually up to like 100 mils an hour um, because you shouldn't have more than that, right? Um, and then it has a little drain to where you can dump it into the big bag or you can dump it every hour, okay? That's the type that that patient should have. Okay, versus the regular just a Foley bag, right? If they only have that Foley bag, my recommendation to you is change it out because when you see that graduated cylinder on the outside, that should be a trigger to you that I need to be checking this every hour, okay? Um, CDI is a continuous bladder irrigation, okay? And that's to make sure that no clots are being prevented or formed, okay, that clots are not being formed. We want it to prevent clots. We use CBI a lot if we've had, um, if a, a male patient has had a transurethral prostate resection, a TERP, um, because we want to flow high flow of saline through um, to make sure that we don't have a clot that's going to um, cause a destruction, okay. So we're going to measure, monitor for complications of rejection, thrombosis, stenosis, and then other complications like infection. And then they're going to have immunosuppressive drug therapy okay, to prevent rejection of that organ. Your home care and self-care management, there's a nice section in your book that talks about... Um, it's 1409. Um, it's called the Focused Assessment, the Patient After Kidney Transplant.
And then it gives you, um, again, the National Kidney Foundation, um, the American Association um, of Kidney Patients are good health resources for those patients and their families. So in our evaluation, we want to make sure that they have appropriate fluid and electrolyte imbalance, um, that they have good nutrition, that they're avoiding infection. Um, your book also has a good picture of vascular access. Um, I don't remember what page that's on. Um, 1399. Okay. So, like I said, it takes a while to be able to use that, and it's called a fistula. Um, your book talks about that the vein is officially dilated, um, and it takes 8 to 12 weeks for it to be what they call mature. Okay? Um, effective coping strategies. We want to slow um, the complication of chronic kidney disease. Um, and it talks about osteodystrophy. Okay? And this is the first time we've seen this word on a slide. Okay. What, what's the link with osteodystrophy? Okay. When I have chronic kidney disease, okay, I can have impaired vitamin D, okay, which then disrupts my ability to absorb calcium. Okay, because remember, I've got to have vitamin D and calcium. They go together. Okay, and if I have that disruption, then that's where I start to get some of my bone disorders. Okay, and a loss in calcium. Then we want to monitor for anxiety and depression. And a lot of times we're going to be preparing that patient for end of life. Questions that you have. Okay, let me run back through my notes here. So, what's the main function of the kidney? Okay, urination, elimination. Okay. Excrete, hydrogen ion, reabsorb bicarb. Okay. It always, always functions based on perfusion. Okay. So, if any condition causes a decrease, a sensation where the kidneys say, oh, I'm not getting an adequate perfusion, that renin-angiotensinogen system gets activated to increase blood pressure. Okay? Um, we talked about conditions that promote stones, diabetes, gout, dehydration, hyperparathyroidism. We talked about medications for pyonephritis, okay, Tylenol, antibiotics, two liters of water. Um, we talked about the prills, the ACE inhibitors. We talked about with nephrotic syndrome, what's happening is we've got a decrease in osmotic pressure, okay, um, because there's such a significant loss of albumin. Okay, so um, when I have hydronephrosis, okay, one of the things that I may get as a treatment is a nephrostomy tube, okay, to drain. So it's very similar to the concept that we use for a chest tube, 
Okay, so a catheter is inserted. Um, could be to the side, could be to the back. Um, it's taped down, and then it comes to a little, little fluid collection bag um, versus the chamber that we have for um, a chest tube. But a nephrostomy tube. Um, we talked about the care for stones. We talked about Kussmaul's. Um, your dialysate solution okay, is made independently for each patient. So we don't use the same dialysate solution for every patient. Um, each, so, each solution is made specifically for that patient. So it contains a little bit of potassium so that it can draw out more potassium. It's going to have some bicarb in it to help in, you know, change um, that excess hydrogen ion. And it's going to have a little bit of glucose okay, to help draw out the waste and the water. Okay, and then the other things like urea, um, uric acid, the phosphates, those things all kind of diffuse out. Okay, um, one of the other complications that we see in peritoneal dialysis um, is related to their lipids. Okay, they can have high hepatic triglycerides. Okay, so peritoneal dialysis okay, can cause lipid abnormalities. And then you have um, increased glucose, which causes increased insulin production, which then causes um, an increase in your hepatic um, triglycerides. Questions that you have? Okay. Our little specimen cups over there. I want you, one at a time, to go up. I want you to get a little scratch piece of paper. And I want you to describe each of those cups, specimen one, two, and three. And I want you to give us our, your best guess as what abnormality is with each of those specimens. Okay? So one is the top, two, middle, three, at the very bottom.